Well, today I'm going to finish Tocqueville, uh, or to put it a different way, I'm, I'm going to uh, say what I can about Tocqueville in 50 minutes, uh, which is hardly finishing him. In fact, we've hardly begun. But I want to talk about two things, two, two aspects of the book today, again, which will again only scratch the surface. Uh, and the, uh, the, those two topics are the following. I want to talk about a little bit about the uh, moral and psychological components or features of the democratic state, uh, which is largely the uh, subject matter of volume two of the democracy. And I also want to speak about the role of statesmanship. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the issue of Tocqueville as educator, as a kind of political educator. And I want to talk today, uh, end up today, by talking a little bit about uh, how he understands uh, the role of the, the democratic statesman. Uh, but the first part, uh, first, first subject, uh, is largely, again, the uh, subject matter of volume two. Volume one of the democracy uh, as you've probably noticed, <coughs> focuses mainly, not exclusively to be sure, but mainly on what I suppose we would call the social and political institutions uh, of democratic society, the institutional uh, development uh, of the democratic state. Uh, volume two uh, focuses on much more on, uh, so to call it, the moral and psychological uh, components uh, of the democratic uh, individual. Uh, Tocqueville here shows himself more concerned with the internal developments, the, again, the moral and psychological determinants uh, of, the dem of, democratic so char of democratic character. What is it to have a democratic soul, uh, so to speak? That, I think, is Tocqueville's uh, concern in the second volume, which in many ways, at least to my uh, way of reading it, makes volume two a sort of philosophically richer uh, discussion uh, than volume one, uh, because precisely because it focuses on what has the democratic social state done to us? Uh, how has it transformed us uh, as individuals? How has it shaped us uh, as individuals? Uh, these were, in many ways, Tocqueville's deepest problems. And in this part of the book, he shows himself to be a kind of moral psychologist of the democratic soul, very much along the same lines uh, as we saw in Plato, for example, in volume eight uh, of The Republic, where Plato speaks about the different kinds of individuals, the different kinds of souls. Uh, that are appropriate and have been shaped by different kinds uh, of, of regimes. What I'd like to start with, I want to focus on three uh, aspects, spend a little time on three of the components, aspects, uh, psychological um, uh, components of uh, the democratic individual. And uh, those in no particular order I want to discuss as compassion, uh, what this translation has as restiveness, and self-interest. Uh, taken together, I think these three terms or these three concepts constitute the, as it were, the sort of moral scope of the democratic state. In describing these character traits, uh, Tocqueville is providing us with a kind of moral phenomenology, uh, and excuse, uh, please, a rather pretentious term, a uh, kind of moral phenomenology of democratic life, uh, one in which we are invited uh, to look and ask whether we see ourselves in this description and whether we like uh, what it is we see. The first of these features that I want to focus on uh, the most important moral effect in some respects that democracy has had on its citizen is for Tocqueville the constant tendency to make us gentler towards one another. This is an old 18th century theme, to make us more compassionate 
to make us gentler in our manners, habits, morals with one another. Uh, this is an old problem. Montesquieu, Tocqueville's great uh, 18th century precursor. Montesquieu had argued in the spirit of the laws, l'esprit des lois, that it was commerce that instituted a kind of, 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 of softening effects uh, on manners and morals. Uh, moving us or taking us from a kind of warlike, aristocratic ethic to one uh, of gentler manners and morals. And, and Montesquieu had attributed this largely to the influence of, of commerce. Rousseau, you will remember, in the Second Discourse, the Discourse on Inequality, made pitié or compassion uh, a repugnance to view the suffering of others uh, is a fundamental feature uh, of natural man. Compassion for Rousseau remained a kind of remnant of our natural goodness. Uh, the fact that we st can still cry or sympathize or empathize, as we might say, with the plight of others, um, even with the growth of noisier and more powerful passions. This sort of capacity for sympathy or compassion remains, even in civilized life, a kind of remnant uh, of our natural goodness. But for Tocqueville, this feature of compassion is not so much a feature of natural man uh, as it was for uh, Rousseau, but it is for democratic uh, life, a democratic social life. It is not nature, but democracy that has rendered us gentler uh, and led to the softening of morals and manners. What does Tocqueville me mean by that when he says life in democracy has become gentler? In a very powerful chapter uh, called How Mores Become Milder as Conditions Are Equalized, here he describes uh, some of the moral and psychological consequences uh, of the transition from the age of aristocracy to one of democracy. Under aristocratic times, he says, uh, in aristocratic angel ages, individuals inhabited a world apart where members of one class or one tribe may have been similar to one another, but they regarded themselves as being fundamentally different from the members of all other social classes or tribes. Uh, this did not so much render people cruel, but it did render them indifferent uh, to the pain and suffering of others outside their group. Under democracy, however, he says, where all are equal, all of us tend to think and feel in nearly the same manner. We no longer make or imagine these kinds of distinctions. The moral imagination, so-called, of the democratic citizen is able to transport itself uh, into the positions of others uh, more easily uh, than individuals living in, ar in aristocratic times. All become alike, or at least all are uh, projected or perceived as being alike in our range of emotions, sensibilities, capacities for moral sympathies. As people become more like one another, Tocqueville says, they show themselves reciprocally compassionate regarding their miseries and the laws of nations become milder. The laws of nations become milder. They show themselves reciprocally compassionate to one another. That transformation of one of the key ethics of social life for Tocqueville has had profound effects on us. It has certainly made people gentler and more civil to one another. Such things, he tells us, is torture, deliberate cruelty, uh, sort of spectacles of pain and humiliation that were once so much a part of everyday life have largely been eliminated from the world. I say largely, not, not entirely to be sure. Uh, we more readily identify ourselves with the pain or suffering of people possibly in, in very different parts of the world world parts that we've never seen or may never visit. Consider, for example, our response to the victims of the tsunami uh, in Indonesia or the genocide in Darfur. Uh, all of these events 
affecting people in places, again, where we may never go, nevertheless seem to have a claim on our moral sympathies. Uh, President Bill Clinton uh, profoundly uh, captured this sense of enlarged moral sympathy when he told his audiences, I feel your pain. Remember, I don't know, you probably won't remember that, but you've probably heard the, heard the expression. It seems to show a kind of enlargement uh, of the moral sympathies, being able to put oneself uh, in the position uh, of others uh, who one doesn't know and may never meet. Uh, this is all a part of what Tocqueville understands, the softening of morals under uh, a democratic uh, way of life. And Tocqueville clearly regards this in many ways as a moral progress of sorts uh, in our unwillingness to tolerate policies of deliberate cruelty in his statement, uh, perhaps uh, premature, uh, that Americans of all the people in the world uh, have succeeded or almost succeeded in abolishing the death penalty. Not quite true. Uh, but nevertheless, maybe more truer then than it is now. Uh, in democratic centuries, he says, men, uh, but, but all of this compassion, here, here's, but here's the problem, here's the problem. All of this compassion uh, comes still at a price. In democratic centuries, he writes, men rarely devote themselves to one another, but they show a general compassion for all members of the human species. They rarely, he says, devote themselves to one another. This sort of generalized sympathy uh, is genuine but soft. Uh, my ability uh, to feel your pain uh, does not really require me uh, to do much about it. Uh, compassion, uh, you might say, turns out to be a rather easy virtue. Uh, it suggests sensitivity and openness. Uh, it implies caring uh, without being judgmental. Uh, it is not entirely relativistic, uh, but it re certainly refrains from imposing one's own moral judgments and way of life upon others. Does Tocqueville believe uh, that democratic peoples are in danger of becoming uh, too soft, uh, too morally sensitive, uh, too incapable of exhibiting the kind of harsher, uh, what we might call uh, more aristocratic virtues of nobility, of self-sacrifice, of love of honor that formed the moral code of previous times? Well, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, he surely did believe that was becoming the case. Uh, compassion is for Tocqueville in many ways an admirable uh, sentiment. And again, it is one likely to expand our rage of moral sympathies. But there is something called a kind of misplaced compassion uh, that Tocqueville is very fearful about. Compassion is a virtue, but it carries with, us, with it, like every virtue, its own particular forms of misuse. Uh, for example, when compassion becomes a standard by which to express our forms of moral superiority uh, to others. I mean, consider the following. To be accused today, particularly on places like college campuses, to be accused of insensitivity to others, to some kind of moral insensitivity, is among many of us considered one of the worst moral crimes imaginable. Uh, we must all care, or at least we must all pretend as if we care, yes, or must be seen to care, about the plight of others much worse off than ourselves. And the result of this, and I think t this is Tocqueville's point, seems to be to create new moral hierarchies uh, of compassion where one's superiority is, is uh, demonstrated by our heightened sensitivity and feeling uh, for others. And it is precisely this kind of, uh, you know, misplaced compassion, you know, asking the question, who is the most sensitive uh, among us? A very Rousseauian type question. This kind of uh, misplaced uh, compassion uh, that is, I think, one of the psychological determinants of what we would call today uh, political correctness. Uh, obviously a term Tocqueville does not use, but you might think of the way in which the 
language of pity, compassion, sensitivity has so much shaped our moral vocabulary, ways of thinking about ourselves uh, and judging others. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, watch almost any, uh, any daytime uh, afternoon show like Oprah or any of these other shows and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Of course, you, you've, all, you've all seen these shows. I think much, many more times than I have, but nevertheless. Compassion, compassion. This is the first or one feature uh, of democratic social life. But it is not the only one. It is connected, or at least it exists alongside another. And at the core also of the psychological uh, life of modern democratic citizens, Tocqueville writes, is a profound sense of uneasiness, of anxiety, that Tocqueville calls by the French term inquietude, a word that maybe is difficult to translate into English, inquietude, anxiety. Uh, in an earlier translation, this was called restlessness. Uh, in this particular translation, you have restiveness. Uh, to indicate the sort of perpetually dissatisfied character uh, of the democratic soul. I mean, in many ways, the democratic soul, like democracy itself, uh, is never complete. Uh, it is always a work in progress. And this feeling of perpetual restlessness for Tocqueville is tied to the desire for well-being, and by that he means particularly material well-being. It is the desire for happiness, measured largely in terms of material happiness, that is the dominant drive of the democratic soul. Uh, in many ways, Tocqueville brings to his analysis of democratic restiveness, you can see in it, something of the aristocrat's disdain uh, for the acquisition of, you might say, mere material goods for which most of us uh, have to work so hard uh, to acquire. I mean, perhaps more than anything else, this is what perplexes Tocqueville about democracy. Uh, democracy meant for him predominantly a kind of middle class uh, way of life, bourgeois life, made up of people who are constantly in pursuit of some obscure object of their own uh, desires. I mean, consider the following passage, one of my favorite from the entire book, uh, from a chapter entitled, Why the Americans Show Themselves So Restive, So Restive in the Midst of Their Well-Being. Let me read it at some length. In the United States, he says, a man carefully builds a dwelling in which to pass his declining years and sells it while the roof is being laid. He plans a garden and he rents it out just as he was going to taste its fruits. He clears a field and he leaves it to others to care for the harvesting. He embraces a profession and quits it. He settles in a place from which he departs soon after so as to take his changing desires elsewhere. Should his private affairs give him some respite, he immediately plunges into the whirlwind of politics. And when, toward the end of a year filled with some leisure, still remains to him, he carries his restive curiosity here and there within the vast limits of the United States, carrying his restive curiosity wherever he may go. He will thus go 500 leagues in a day in order better to distract himself from his happiness. What a wonderful place to distract himself from his happiness. Death finally comes and it stops him before he has grown weary of this useless pursuit of complete felicity that always flees from him. Does that passage sound like anything we may have read here? Does it not sound as if it is modeled almost exactly after Plato's uh, description uh, of the democratic soul? 
uh, in Book 8 uh, of the Republic, a person who is constantly moving, constantly restless, constantly unable to concentrate or to bear down on the one or very few things that give life a sense of wholeness uh, and meaning uh, and integrity. Here is the democratic uh, man, restive in the midst of well-being, constantly moving ahead or moving to, as he says, distract himself from his own happiness. Tocqueville writes here, it seems, with a kind of disdain uh, for a life understood as a constant and, in his view, self-defeating uh, pursuit of happiness. The desire for well-being, you might say, becomes the right, uh, almost the right, of the Democrat. And the more one desires happiness, the more it eludes our grasp. Uh, so just after the sentence, ju the, the sentence just after uh, the passage I just read, Tocqueville says, one is at first astonished to contemplate the singular agitation displayed by so many happy men in the midst of their abundance. And you can s sense Tocqueville's irony in his use of the term, so many happy, the uh, distractions, the agitation, uh, complete agitation displayed, he says, by so many happy individuals in the midst of their abundance. There's a world of social commentary uh, condensed into those sentences. His combination of words like agitation and abundance in the same, again, in the same context as the pursuit of happiness indicates for him that this way of life is more likely to bring frustration and anxiety uh, than it is to bring us satisfaction uh, and repose. And he traces this continual restlessness uh, back to what seems to be for the democratic social, uh, for the democratic individual, the virtual obligation to be happy. Uh, I would ask you in this context, if you have some time, to read Darren McMahon's uh, wonderful new book on a history of happiness. Uh, to give you a little bit of an indication of the way this term has been used throughout its history and the way in which, in many ways, the obligation to pursue happiness, uh, to uh, restiveness, that kind of restiveness, uh, is the source of so much, as he puts it, singular. The singular melancholy, he says, that the inhabitants of democratic lands often display amid their abundance. Life liberty, the pursuit of happiness, have become what one person once called a kind of joyless quest uh, for joy. And this is the second feature, uh, this restless or restive character of, of, of democracy. And finally, the third feature of democratic psychology that I want to focus on is this idea of self-interest or self-interest well understood uh, as Tocqueville uh, calls it. This is a doctrine with which everybody uh, is familiar from courses on moral psychology, on utilitarianism, to modern courses on, uh, from in economics and game theory and other things where the term self-interest is regarded almost as sort of a talismanic, pro has the almost talismanic properties of explaining all kinds of human behavior. But Tocqueville means something very specific by self-interest, or self-interest well understood. It is in one sense the kind of, you might say, everyday utilitarianism, not in any strict sense of the term, uh, with which we are instinctively familiar when we hear to, when we hear or are told things like honesty is the best policy and things like this. It seems simple uh, and obvious enough, but it in fact has a very complex uh, and difficult uh, history. Uh, by the time that Tocqueville wrote these chapters uh, in the democracy, theories of self-interest had long been a kind of staple uh, of European uh, moral philosophy, going back to the 17th century at least, going back to people like Hobbes and, and others. Uh, the question is, what, what work does this idea, this concept of self-interest, rightly understood, understood, do for Tocqueville? In the first place, he, he understands it somewhat differently than I think we would. Uh, when we hear the term self-interest, uh, 
uh, we are likely to think of it as, as opposed to or to, to think of its antonym as indicating some kind of altruism. Uh, while, while interest or self-interest is thought of as inherently self-regarding, altruism or something like that is, is an, other regarded, an other regarding disposition, regarding the welfare, well-being of others. But when Tocqueville talks about self-interest, self-interested behavior was put forward by him as a kind of comprehensive antonym to behavior motivated by vanity, by honor, and above all, by the concept of glory. Uh, terms, remember, thinking going back to Hobbes in some way, and Hobbes is concerned to replace ideas of vanity, vainglory, and pride with a notion of, you know, fear uh, of death, uh, kind of self-interested uh, behavior. While glory uh, was for Tocqueville and, and others uh, as associated with war and warlike pursuits. Interest, self-interest, was invariably associated with commerce and peaceful competition. In contrast, in other words, to the aristocratic uh, concern with fame and honor, interest was regarded, self-interest was regarded as a relatively peaceful or harmless uh, disposition, leading us to cooperate with one another for the sake of common ends. The pursuit of self-interest has a kind of unmistakably democratic uh, and egalitarian impulse behind it. The pursuit of self-interest is something literally everyone uh, is able to follow, even while such things as honor and glory seem to be uh, by nature unequally uh, available to different people. And into this debate between, uh, between an ethic of honor and glory and an ethic of self-interest, or self-interest rightly understood, enters Tocqueville, enters democracy in America. He begins his chapter called How the Americans Combat Individualism by the Doctrine of Self-Interest Rightly Understood with the following sentence, with the following observation. He writes, when the world was led by a few wealthy and powerful individuals, these like to form for themselves. They like to form for themselves a sublime idea of the duties of man. They were pleased to profess that it is, a that it is glorious to forget oneself and that it is fitting to do good without self-interest, like God himself. This was the official doctrine of the time in matters of morality, speaking of aristocratic ages. I doubt that men, he says, were more virtuous in aristocratic centuries than in others, but it is certain that the beauties of virtue were constantly spoken of. Only in secret, he concludes, did men study its utility. Uh, you might think about that passage, perhaps, uh, in section, but note that Tocqueville adds to the concept of self-interest this idea or this modifier of well understood. Uh, well understood. What does this add? What does he intending that to say? Uh, self-interest well understood is not the same thing as egoism or what Rousseau called amor propre, for example. Uh, it is not the desire simply to be talked about, to be looked at, to be first in the race of life. Uh, in that way. Rather, self-interest is connected, and self-interest well understood is connected to this passion for well-being and the desire to improve one's conditions that remain for Tocqueville a very important wellspring uh, of human actions. But it is, is important to remember that these are not the only desires, or these are not the only motives for action. Tocqueville probably dis is distinguished from many social scientists today by suggesting that self-interest well understood is not some kind of universal determinant uh, of human behavior. It is not, it is not something uh, universal. It is a product of a particular social state. Uh, a particular, uh, we might say, the, the democratic social state. He is not, in this sense, a kind of moral or psychological reductionist who wants to see one cause of human behavior across all centuries and all climates. Uh, he is not saying that all uh, behavior is self-interested. In fact, in that very chapter on self-interest rightly understood, you will remember, you may remember, 
probably don't remember, uh, that he quotes in a footnote uh, a, an essay by Montaigne, uh, a name that I've mentioned before, an essay by Montaigne called Of Glory, uh, Of Glory, to remind the reader that the desire for fame and honor uh, will always contend with the desire for well-being and happiness. And in many ways, these are uh, two conflicting uh, motives uh, of, of, of human behavior. What did he believe that this ethic of self-interest well understood would bring about? Uh, again, like compassion, uh, the, the doctrine of self-interest has done much to sort of soften uh, the, uh, the harsher features uh, of the aristocratic ethics of, of warlike, of the warlike nobility. Uh, Self-interest well understood as a kind of antidote to uh, an ethic of fame uh, and glory. And yet, you can see throughout volume two especially how Tocqueville laments the decline of this older aristocratic codes of honor and chivalry. By contrast, the doctrine of self-interest well understood is not lofty, he says, but it is clear and sure. It has characteristics of reliability and predictability. Uh, it is not itself a virtue, he says, but it can form people who are, and these are his terms, regulated, temperate, moderate, foresighted, masters of themselves. Regulated, temperate, moderate, foresight, uh, farsighted. Uh, what does that sound like? Uh, think, about, think about that. What kind of person is this and what has it created? These are the virtues of the democratic republic. Uh, again, these may not be heroic or extraordinary qualities, but they, have the, they do have the virtue of being within the range of everyone. But uh, is, such, uh, a, is, such a, is such a code or is such a moral code uh, desirable for itself? That's something that Tocqueville leaves a little bit up in the air. Of all philosophical theories, he calls them, as he calls it, the doctrine of self-interest rightly understood is, he says, the most appropriate to the needs of men in our time. Uh, think about that judgment. It is the most appropriate to the needs of men in our time. It doesn't seem to suggest uh, that this is uh, either universal or necessarily that it is the best. It is simply the best adapted to the needs of our time, to our level of humanity, to where, where we are now. Uh, and again, there, there is, there is an implicit, to be sure, an implicit kind of critique uh, suggested in, those, in that phrase that you might think about as you read or as you go back to that important chapter on self-interest and its role in, again, the shaping of, of the modern democratic individual. So these three characteristics, compassion, um, uh, what was the other one? What? Restlessness, yes, oh good. Um, yes, yeah, I can't even remember what I'm talking about. Restlessness and self-interest. I was just, I was quizzing you, I was check, check, just checking. That doesn't have anything to do with short-term memory loss. These are, these are what, is, what has shaped us. And uh, Tocqueville holds this up as a kind of portrait, the democratic individual. Uh, and also, of course, primarily to, not so much to the democratic individual, but to his readers back in France, uh, and saying this seems to be uh, the future shape of, of humanity, of democratic humanity. Uh, we need both to adapt to it in some ways. We have to both recognize that this is what's coming and adapt to it. But we also have to be, to some degree, wary of what, of what is coming and what kind of people uh, we may create uh, out of ourselves, what might, may be created. And this brings me to the, to the theme uh, that I mentioned at the beginning about democratic statecraft, democratic education. What is the role uh, of the statesman uh, in a democratic age? How should one adapt as well as try to guide uh, these features? 
uh, Democracy in America uh, is a work of political education, a supreme work of political education addressed to leaders or potential leaders uh, not only for Tocqueville's time uh, but for the future. The possibilities of statecraft are, as they are always, dependent on what we understand politics uh, and political science to be. What is it? In the introduction to the book, uh, in one of those characteristically epigrammatic sentences, and you should be uh, attuned to these, Tocqueville often likes to give these one-sentence paragraphs to, to highlight an idea, you know, to really make it stand out. I don't recommend it for you. Uh, but for him, uh, he takes one sentence and can make it, uh, turns it into a paragraph. He, he talks about this book, he says, is a new political science for a world altogether new. That, that statement has to jump out at you at the page. What is this new political science? A new political science, again, in, in some ways following Machiavelli, who had, uh, uh, that departs from the ancients, uh, but perhaps also from his modern predecessors, too, like Machiavelli and Hobbes or Locke and Rousseau. What is the distinguishing feature of the political science uh, for a new democratic age, for a world altogether new? Tocqueville's new political science, let me suggest to you, is based on a novel and profound understanding of the relationship between history or historical forces and human agency, between individual power and individual powers or agency and historical forces. Let me try to explain uh, what I mean by that. As any reader of the democracy quickly notes, even from the opening pages of the book, Tocqueville attributes a kind of providential power uh, to history. Uh, the immense uh, centuries-long progress uh, or transition from the aristocratic to the democratic era seems to be, as he describes it, almost an act of divine providence, almost of divine will. He warns his readers uh, uh, that it is a mistake, uh, it is self-defeating to try to, re to resist or to turn back uh, this movement. This would be futile. It would not only be futile, he even suggests it would be impious. It would be in some ways to go against the will of God, as if the hand of God were behind this immense historical progress or process. Tocqueville no doubt deliberately overstates that argument, but he does so, I think, in order to make a, a serious and profound point. Our politics, or politics, are deeply embedded within long structures of human history that we can do little to alter and escape. We seem to be deeply embedded, we as individuals, deeply embedded within these structures. This is it, to, to, or to use a term that modern political scientists often use to describe this, it is an argument from what is often called path dependency that we are, again, deeply embedded within historical processes, tendencies, uh, paths of development that we can do little to resist or control. And in many ways, Tocqueville often, you will find Tocqueville often writing as if he is some kind of historical or sociological determinist, uh, allowing little room for individual initiative or agency. Words like fate, destiny, uh, tendency uh, are frequently used throughout the book uh, to underscore the limits of political action. It would even be an interesting experiment uh, or a, in, in to, to go through the book page by page and find how many examples of those, those kinds of words, tendency, fate, uh, destiny, these kind of deterministic words that, that suggest irresistible movements, movement uh, of history. Uh, he, he, how many times he uses this and these and in what context? context. And he frequently offers predictions throughout the book uh, 
on the basis of what he regards to be underlying historical and social trends. You can hardly read a, a, a page of the book, sometimes not even a paragraph, without finding in it some kind of prediction uh, based on uh, these trends. I, again, I would ask you, you know, if you have time, go through the book. You don't have time this semester. Maybe it will be a great senior essay later on to go through the book and find examples, as many as you can, of, again, predictions that Tocqueville makes on the basis of these historical, uh, these, this claim about historical <coughs> forces. Uh, and much of this seems to deny, taken literally, much of this would seem to deny the role of independent uh, human initiative uh, or statecraft in history. Consider uh, the following passage from uh, pages 154 and 55 of your translation. Here's what Tocqueville writes about the statesman. He says, sometimes after a thousand efforts, the legislator succeeds in exerting an indirect influence on the destiny of nations. And then one celebrates his genius, whereas often the geographical position of the country, about which he can do nothing, a social state that was created without his concurrence, mores and ideas of whose origin he is ignorant, a point of departure unknown to him, impart irresistible movements to society against which he struggles in vain and which carry him along in turn. There, there you go. He gives us a, a, a list of all of the different determinants of, 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 of human, you know, surrounding conditions, uh, geography, mores, social position. These, he says, impart an irresistible movements to society. There is that kind of deterministic language again, against which he, the statesman, can uh, do nothing. And yet he begins, this, he begins that little statement by saying that after a thousand efforts, he succeeds in exerting an indirect influence on the destiny of nations, and then he is celebrated as a great genius. You can see Tocqueville's irony and what, what appears to be downplaying uh, the uh, abilities or the role of the legislator, the statesman, to, to effect uh, change of any significant kind. Uh, I don't like to be political, but one might wonder what our president would have made of that uh, had he read that passage or thought about it or those around him had thought about it uh, a couple of years ago before our current uh, miseries uh, began. Uh, anyway, this passage uh, almost seems to be mocking the claims of Machiavelli or Rousseau, who, who saw the ability of, the new, of a new prince or a legislator to found peoples and institutions. Uh, Tocqueville seems to regard the, that the legislator can do relatively little on his own, but is strongly hemmed in uh, by a host of factors, geography, social customs, morality, again, over which uh, one can do little. Uh, the legislator is more like uh, a ship's captain, uh, dependent on the external circumstances that control the fate uh, of the ship. And he even goes on to say, the legislator resembles a man who plots his course in the middle of the ocean. Thus he can direct the vessel that carries him, but he cannot change its structure, create winds, or prevent the ocean from rising under his feet. Uh, all of this seems to be on the side of those historical features that, that limit uh, what we can do. Yet if Tocqueville uh, often writes as if the statesman is hemmed in by these kinds of circumstances, uh, he also, and you see this especially throughout volume two, strongly opposes all systems all intellectual or philosophical systems of historical determinism that deny to us the power of human agency. Uh, while he sometimes writes to shame or to humble uh, the pretensions of human greatness, he is just as concerned about the tendency, in fact the very dangerous tendency, towards self-abnegation that denies, uh, the, denies the role of the individual in politics and history. He often writes as if the, it is the peculiarity of democratic times uh, when all peoples are considered equal 
and therefore all of us considered equally powerless to affect or change anything. And again, I would ask, who has not felt this way uh, at some time, maybe all the time, that with all of us being, again, more or less equal, no one seems to have the power, a kind of singular power, to affect any great social change. There is one wonderful chapter uh, among others, but I'll, I'll just mention one. Look at the chapter, uh, and I can't recall offhand the, the exact uh, 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 number of the chapter, but the one called on, on historians, on the role of historians in democratic and aristocratic times, and how he, how he shows us that in aristocratic ages, he's thinking particularly of the ancient world, historians attributed to extraordinary individuals all the power to affect nations and change nations. But in democratic times, in modern times, we, we tend to think of historians, and one, one might also take his term historian to include social science as well. Uh, we tend to pro project systems which deny the power, uh, the unique power uh, of the individual. We are all uh, products of, of, of vast, uh, you might say, historical or causal circumstances over which the individual has no control. Think of the way in which uh, Marxism, uh, again, denies the power of the individual. Freudian analysis de you know, sees all of our desires and uh, motives as determined by forces over which we have uh, little control. All kinds of economic theories of development, again, which uh, see us all uh, acting under certain kind of uniform rules of human behavior. Where is, the where is the room for the individual? It's a, that, that chapter is a wonderful illustration uh, of Tocqueville's general point. So what is then his teaching? Uh, and more specifically, what is his, vi is his advice uh, for the statecraft uh, of the future? Uh, and it seems that the, by the end of the book, Tocqueville is walking on a very narrow tightrope. He wishes to convince his contemporaries uh, that the democratic age is upon us, that the transition from aristocracy to democracy is irreversible, uh, that, it cannot be, uh, that it cannot be resisted, and, and that what he calls the democratic revolution uh, is an accomplished fa fact. And yet at the same time, he wants to instruct us that what form democracy will take in the future will very much depend on will, on intelligence, on what he sometimes calls enlightenment, and especially on individual human agency. What form democracy will take? Democracy may be inevitable. Equality, the age of equality may be inevitable, but democracy is not of all one piece. It depends not just on impersonal historical forces, but on what you might call the active virtue and intelligence of individuals ranging from self-interest rightly understood to honor and ambition. Democracy can still take many forms, and whether it will favor liberty or be favorable to liberty or to some kind of collectivism is for him very much an open question what form democracy will take. And Tocqueville returns to this theme, a very, very important theme, in the last, very last paragraph of his book. I am not unaware, he tells his readers, that several of my contemporaries have thought that peoples are never masters of themselves here below. Uh, there's little we can do. We are never met. And that they necessarily obey, I do not know which insurmountable and, uh, and unintelligent force born of previous events, the race, the soil, or the climate. Those, he says, are false and cowardly doctrines that can never produce anything but weak men and pusillanimous nations. That is to say, these doctrines of historical determinism have an actual effect on people. It makes us weak, it makes us cowardly, it makes, us, uh, it makes entire societies, uh, and it enervates entire society. And yet, he continues, providence has not created the entire race entirely independent or perfectly enslaved. It traces, it is true, he's speaking about providence, it traces, it is true, a fatal circle around each man that he cannot leave. But within this vast limits, man is powerful and free. So too, he says, with people. Tocqueville leaves us 
in other words, not with a solution, uh, but rather with a paradox or, I would say, a challenge for us to consider. We are determined, but not altogether so. S the statesman must know how to navigate the shoals between historical, social, and cultural forces over which we uh, have no say, and those matters of institutional design and moral suasion that are still within our power to affect. P politics, as intelligent people uh, have always known, uh, which is not to say all people, to be sure, but as intelligent people have known, uh, is a medium that takes place within language. It is a matter of providing people with the linguistic and the rhetorical abilities both to construct their pasts and to imagine their futures. Uh, it is language, uh, going back to Aristotle, it is logos, it is language that gives us a latitude, an ability to adapt to changing circumstances and to create new ones. Tocqueville provides us, living in a democratic age, with the language to shape the future of uh, democratic societies. What we do uh, with that language, how we apply it to new circumstances and conditions that Tocqueville could never have imagined will be, of course, entirely up to us. Uh, and on that note, uh, I have to end Tocqueville. And Wednesday, I'll see you for our last class, and I'm going to talk about where we go from there.